Thanks so much, Robert, for the uh, introduction and for the invitation. I uh, appreciate everyone taking some time out of your day to, um, to chat with me. Um, as Robert indicated, he, he kindly invited me to, to give this, um, this chat and to address the topic of what does an ethicist do? Uh, and I think that comes a bit of the background is, is I'm um, a relatively new uh, addition to the Providence Care team. Uh, I'm the ethicist and that's a new role for Providence Care. And so I think we thought it might be a kind of a good idea to talk through the idea of an ethicist and how, a, how an ethicist sort of fits into a healthcare organization, how they relate to clinical teams and so forth. So uh, I'm hoping this will be, I mean, it's certainly a valuable opportunity for me to just sort of think through the role a little bit. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be interesting for you folks. And, and I hope we have some nice time to chat uh, at the end because uh, I'm certainly open to feedback and, and different uh, thoughts and experiences from you folks, particularly if some of you may have interacted with ethicists uh, in other contexts and have different ideas or additional ideas, um, I'm happy to chat. So just in terms of like a big picture structure for today, I kind of thought it may, might be uh, useful to go through a bit of background uh, and talk about the very idea of ethics, like what is ethics itself? Um, and to kind of go from that to the idea of like, what is an ethicist? Uh, and once we figure out what an ethicist is, we can ask what an ethicist in fact does. Uh, and I want to close by talking about a couple things that, that I, ethicists don't do, or at any rate, I think they probably shouldn't do. Uh, and we can, we can talk about that. So, oh, and I should also say just before I get going, I, I certainly welcome, uh, sort of questions throughout the talk. I don't think it needs to be like me talking and waiting for a discussion till the end. So if, as I'm saying something, you wanna kind of chime in, uh, you've got a question or a comment you want to add as I'm speaking, feel free to do so. Uh, the only thing I'll note is that I don't currently see kind of faces and I, I don't see the chat. So I'll just ask you to, if you want to interject, feel free to do so uh, just by, by um, using the mic. And maybe Robert, if you see any questions in the chat that you think should be brought up sort of as I'm going, feel free to, to let me know if that's- Will right. do, yep. Thank you. Okay, so let's start off talking about uh, the very idea of ethics. What is ethics? I mean, ethics is uh, a lot of things, but I think of sort of ethics at the most fundamental level as a branch of inquiry uh, that addresses questions about the values and principles that should guide human action, human decision-making, and human behavior. Uh, so conceived in this way, when we engage in ethical inquiry, uh, we are interested in questions like what kinds of actions or behaviors are, are right or wrong, uh, or good or bad. We can use these ideas interchangeably sometimes, sometimes not. Uh, we can ask what makes human action behavior right or wrong or good or bad. So ethicists are interested in if we know that something's good or we know that something's bad, uh, eth eth ethicists like to ask, like, why is that? What would make something good or bad? Uh, we're interested in what kind of obligations we have to one another. And ethicists are interested in really big picture questions about like what is the sort of meaning and significance of human life? What is most important in human life? Uh, what kind of lives should we want to lead? So I describe ethics as a branch of inquiry uh, and sort of in, the, in that um, sort of vein, there are lots of people who study ethics in a, in a pretty systematic way. So for example, philosophers and moral theologians study, study ethics in like academic contexts, right? They write papers, they, they um, have conferences and engage in rigorous and sometimes heated discussion. Um, but ethics isn't just about philosophers and moral theologians doing their thing. We all face ethical issues in our day-to-day -day lives, right? That's really what ethics is about. It's about human lives and the problems that we face in them. So we, in, in our ordinary lives, we engage in ethical thinking anytime we ask really ordinary questions, right? What, like when we're in a given situation and we don't know what the right thing to do is, uh, when we ask kind of what do we owe, what kind of obligations do we have to our family members, our friends, uh, our colleagues at work, our clients, our patients, the people we serve in our work, and to other people, say other citizens in our community. Um, these are difficult and ethical questions, what we owe to these people and how we um, balance the things, uh, that, the obligations that we have uh, to different groups of people. And of course, when we kind of pause and reflect on, on whether our lives are going 
the way we want them to on whether we're doing what we think is really important in our lives. When we ask what kind of life should we want to live, uh, then we're doing ethics, even though we may or may not be philosophers or moral theologians. So in responding to those kinds of questions, uh, folks who are engaged in sort of systematic ethical work, look for explanations for why we should or shouldn't act in certain ways. Uh, and they look for, for guidance when we don't know how we should act, right? Eth ethicists think about like, well, what kind of deliberation do we need to do when we don't know what the right thing to do is? Uh, now, in ethical theory, explanations for these questions, for why we should or shouldn't act in certain ways and, and how we should think about deliberating on ethical questions, generally appeal to uh, values or principles, right? So they appeal to sort of fundamental, uh, we might say, goods of human life that, that it is thought can, in some sense, give us guidance. So I just sort of listed like a, like a host of values or principles, and I'm not here distinguishing between values and principles, but we can talk about that later if, if folks want to. But I'm, I'm guessing that some of these will be familiar to you. So for example, respect, dignity, compassion, and stewardship. Uh, those, are, uh, those are articulated actually as, the, as Providence Cares Va uh, values in the mission, vision, and values of Providence Care, right? But these should be familiar to, to all of us, whether or not we work at Providence Care. Uh, individual autonomy, justice, and beneficence. Some of you might sort of recognize those are uh, values or principles that are frequently invoked in the context of healthcare. Uh, if you kind of read bioethics literature, uh, these are often identified as kind of like the central principles in healthcare. They're not by any means the only things that matter, but they're often invoked as kind of primary or central. And of course, there are, there are lots of other values and principles we could add uh, to, the, to the kind of ethical stew, right? They want kindness, honesty, privacy, and confidentiality. Um, there's, it, the list could go on and on. But the idea in ethical inquiry is to examine these values, to think about them, to think about how they relate to one another and how they apply to human life. Now, what makes ethics difficult is that there's all kinds of disagreement. And even when there's not disagreement, there's not always certainty or confidence uh, about which values and principles are the right ones, right? Like which ones we should endorse or accept as our values. Uh, there's not certainty about how we should interpret them. Right? Like, what does it mean to be compassionate? What does it mean to be honest? What does it mean to be a good steward of resources? Uh, and there's questions about how to prioritize them, right? Like, which values and principles are most important? Um, and there are questions about how we apply them in different kinds of circumstances. So, right, there's all this disagreement and lack of clarity. And, and part of what um, academic ethicists do is, is try to, to think through all those questions and systematize matters. But regardless of what they're up to, uh, this disagreement or this lack of certainty is what gives rise to ethical issues in our lives, right? It's because we disagree or we're not sure about uh, which values and principles to accept or how to interpret, prioritize, and apply them that we run into situations where we don't know the right thing to do, right? We're not sure how to be a good person in a given circumstance or what a good person would do in a particular circumstance. And it's these kinds of situations that give rise to ethical challenges where we need to engage in ethical deliberation. And that's when we sit down and talk about what are our options, what are the values that are relevant to the, to the options and so forth. So that's just meant to be like a big picture sort of like snapshot of, of how I think about the domain of ethics at the most general level. But now I want to talk about the idea of an ethicist, and in particular, the idea of an ethicist in the healthcare context, right? So when we have roles in healthcare organizations that are have titles like ethicist or healthcare ethicist or clinical ethicist, um, that's the kind of role I'm interested in. So in, in the most like in the most basic sense, I think, uh, in the context of healthcare, uh, a professional ethicist is a person who has at least some special training in ethical theory. Uh, and that may in some cases be sort of secular ethical, ethical theory. Um, for example, in a, in a gain from a philosophy department, it may be uh, ethical theory related to a particular faith tradition. So for example, in Catholic uh, healthcare, ethicists generally have special training in Catholic ethics. And of course, it may be a combination of the two. These aren't mutually exclusive. And ethicists don't just have sort of background 
um, sort of abstract training in ethical theory, but they tend also to have training in the application of ethical concepts and techniques of ethical deliberation to the, the types of ethical issues that arise in the healthcare context, right? So ethicists are, are uh, at least ought to have some training and experience in working through the specific sorts of problems that arise uh, in hospitals, for example, or long-term care homes or whatever uh, healthcare context in which they work. Now, a few points about these professional ethicist roles, and I, I think at least this first one is interesting and, and maybe for, for some folks is surprising. Um, I'd certainly be interested to hear what folks have to say about this later on, but um, ethicists are not, uh, certainly not in Canada, a regulated health profession, right? So there's no, uh, like, there's not an Ontario College of Health Ethicists, and there's no governing body that sort of oversees uh, training and standards for people who call themselves ethicists in healthcare organizations. So there's no one set of specific requirements that a person needs to, to meet or satisfy uh, in order to uh, sort of represent themselves as an ethicist and occupy an ethicist role in a hospital. Uh, but despite that sort of lack of, uh, lack of central oversight, centralized oversight or something like that, uh, there are kind of a set of standards that, are, that, that have emerged, I wanna say over the last 10 to 20 years um, that really focus on one, persons having terminal degrees in sort of whatever particular background discipline they're coming from. So I'll talk a bit about different disciplines that people do come from in a moment. Um, but it tends to be the expectation nowadays that in order to be sort of eligible for an ethicist role, uh, if you've studied, if you come, for example, from a philosophy background, that you, you ought to have a PhD in that discipline. If you come from, say, a law background, that you should have uh, like a JD. Uh, or if you come from a medicine, uh, sort of medical background, that you uh, maybe have a, a master's or a PhD in nursing or medicine, although not, not absolutely necessarily. It's not clear across the board. And the other really uh, sort of emerging expectation is that uh, to, to represent yourself and to work as an ethicist, you ought also to have had specific health ethics training in what are generally called ethics fellowships. Um, so just by way of example, in my own case, uh, after studying philosophy, I went on to do um, what's called the uh, uh, fellowship in clinical and organizational ethics at Unity Health in Toronto. So that was where I sort of cut my teeth in the actual healthcare domain, where I kind of combined uh, abstract ethical training with uh, the uh, uh, on the ground appreciate or learning about experience with on the ground problems in healthcare contexts. Now, uh, partly, I, I mean, I'm, this is kind of speculative, but maybe partly because there's not a sort of central body that sets specific standards that ethicists need to meet. Uh, ethicists tend to come from a, a great variety of different professional and academic backgrounds. So, um, for example, I mean, I've met ethicists who have backgrounds in nursing. Uh, sorry, I just accidentally navigated away. Uh, in nursing, in medicine, so physicians. I've met ethicists who are social workers or previously social workers, folks with backgrounds in law. And as I mentioned earlier, folks with backgrounds in philosophy and theology. I've met uh, ethicists who are, are or were formerly priests, uh, as well as monks. Um, and uh, so it's kind of a, a real a mixed bag. There, there are a lot of different pathways to this particular role. And there are interesting sort of institutional historical explanations for all of that, but I won't sort of get into that uh, today. So that's meant to just be a, a sort of rough uh, overview of, of who these people are who call themselves ethicists and what it is that makes them ethicists. Uh, so now I want to sort of get to the, the real specific question that certainly the talk was advertised as being about, uh, which is what do ethicists do? So kind of have an idea of what ethics is. We kind of know who these people are who call themselves ethicists, but, but what is it that they do? Well, I want to say a few things about this. I mean, first, I note that uh, health ethics is practiced in all kinds of different healthcare contexts, right? So ethicists work in uh, acute care contexts, uh, like there's an ethicist at KGH, for example. Ethicists work in rehab facilities, uh, places like Providence, an organization like Providence Care, right, has um, 
uh, does all kinds of different sorts of care. It has a, runs a long-term care home. It does uh, work in the community. It offers uh, rehabilitation services and psychiatric services. Um, so right, rehab, long-term care, and ethicists work in public health. So, so ethicists practice in all kinds of different contexts, uh, and the specific context in which they practice are going to affect the nature of the work that they do and the specific problems that they need to, um, that they tend to encounter. So the context in which ethics is being done affects what ethicists in fact do, uh, do. it affects their practice. Um, but in general, and we'll try to make this a bit more specific, but in general, the aim of ethics is to apply an understanding of uh, ethical theory, ethical ideas and concepts and techniques of uh, deliberation uh, to apply an understanding of that sort of thing and an understanding of sort of the health system and the way health system factors uh, interact with one another to generate specific ethical issues in a way that will help the folks that ethicists, ethicists work with to identify, uh, analyze, and to resolve the ethical issues that they come across in their work. So I think to, to sort of um, uh, make this a bit more specific, it can be helpful to kind of cut up the terrain and uh, corresponding to, or not corresponding to, pardon me, Luckily, there is a sort of conventional or traditional way of cutting up the terrain or the practice of health ethics. Um, so it, this is quite traditional and, and certainly like in textbooks on, on professional ethics um, and in review articles and that sort of thing, uh, ethics will often be divided into four main areas of practice. And these are clinical ethics consultation, uh, policy development and review. And sometimes we'll go under different names uh, policy development and review at Providence, we often call it policy and system uh, redesign. Uh, the third is education and capacity building. And the fourth is research and scholarship. So I'm going to talk a bit about each of these. Um, I'm going to talk most briefly about uh, the, the second, the third, and fourth ones, because what I actually want to focus on today a bit more is uh, the clinical ethics consultation uh, section. But in those sort of latter three domains, I want to talk a little bit about what ethicists uh, do or generally do. So policy development and review, I, I think in a way that that is what it sounds like. So ethicists will often have a role in their organizations, regardless of what kind of organization they work at, again, uh, say acute care, long-term care, what have you. Ethicists will often have a role in supporting deliberation and decision-making about ethically complex policy issues, right? So, so this is often uh, uh, characterized as a kind of organizational health ethics, right? It's helping the organization make decisions about what kinds of policies it wants to have. So some just uh, sort of traditionally hot button sort of ethics policy issues relate to, for example, uh, no CPR orders or uh, policies related to informed consent, uh, for example, uh, due to, partly due to recent revisions of the federal legislation on medical assistance in dying, lots of healthcare organizations have been revisiting their policies for responding to requests for medical assistance in dying, and ethicists are likely to be involved in those sorts of endeavors. So, so a significant part of ethics practice is supporting policy work at organizations. Uh, education and capacity building uh, is another relatively big one. So, so it's often an expectation of professional ethics roles. Oh my, I've accidentally navigated away again. It's often an expectation for these roles that ethicists will offer a variety of forms of educational or capacity building support within, within and across an organization. So for example, uh, again, depending on, on the nature of a particular ethicist practice, they may often offer, say, in-service sessions for clinical teams on like specific ethics topics that those teams are interested in, right? And different clinical teams may have different uh, sort of sets of ethical concerns. You know, in some contexts, um, informed consent, capacity and substitute decision-making may really be uh, sort of front of mind for some teams. In other cases, it may be sort of privacy and confidentiality issues. Um, but ethicists are, are often meant to be sort of on deck and available and able to deliver ethics education sort of on request from teams. Uh, another kind of common 
um, practices like ethics rounds, right? So like organizational wide uh, talks on specific ethics topics. And I think in a way what we're doing right now is kind of an example uh, of this. And uh, at Providence Care, I think we'll, we're working towards having sort of something like that organizational wide ethics rounds. Uh, and more sort of less significantly, uh, research and scholarship. So this will really depend on the, on the specific organization, but some healthcare organizations uh, will expect ethicists, if they have ethicists, to be engaged in like academic works, right? So research, publishing, conferences, and so forth. And this tends to be more so at when, the, when the organization is like, has an academic affiliation or might be a teaching hospital or something like that. But this is often sort of tacked on as the fourth uh, main dimension of ethics work. So I want to go back to the first um, uh, sort of pillar of ethics work that I mentioned with it, which is clinical ethics consultation. And part of the reason I wanted to focus on this one is um, at least it's, I, I think about it as, as in, in a sense that one of the sort of primary or fundamental uh, focuses for an ethicist, uh, certainly an ethicist working in any kind of um, organization that, that does clinical work. So less so in say a public policy context, but, uh, and I also think of it as a significant component of my role. So I wanna talk about clinical ethics consultation. Uh, in, the, in general, right, ethics consultation is, involves active engagement by an ethicist with uh, like a sort of on the ground with clinical teams, with patients and with families to identify, to address and resolve ethical issues that arise in the clinical context, right? So when it comes to sort of decisions that need to be made um, in the unit or in the clinic. Uh, in general, the, the aim of this consultation is to support the stakeholders, right? To support clinicians themselves, to support families. Often families find themselves in the roles of like substitute decision makers uh, and to support patients in, in working through ethical uh, issues or challenges or complexities that they encounter uh, at the sort of interface of all these stakeholders in the clinic. So what are the, some of the sorts of, of issues that I have in mind here and what are the kind of things that, that, that ethicists aim to do to, to address them? I and mean, I've tried to just compile a list of what I take to be some of the sort of like bread and butter ethical issues that come up for, that tend to come up for clinical ethicists or tend to come up for ethicists doing clinical ethics consultation. So a big one, and, and maybe the one that sort of comes first in almost any list like that, that you're going to encounter are issues related to consent capacity and substitute decision-making, right? So in healthcare, of course, informed consent to treatment is a really important uh, principle of, uh, health, of medical decision-making. But as you all know, it's not always clear sort of what counts as informed consent in a given context. It's not always clear how to think about uh, decisional capacity in different treatment contexts. And it's not always clear how to think about the idea of capacity in relation to all sorts of different ethical decisions that need to be made. And of course, when there are assessments of incapacity, uh, the, the dimension of substitute decision-making comes in, right? So often family members get called upon to make really ethically challenging decisions on behalf of their loved ones. And uh, ethicists are often aim to support substitute decision-makers in, in deliberating about those questions. Uh, other issues relate to like advanced care planning and goals of care, how to think about future care that, that folks may want in situations that they're not familiar with and that they haven't experienced yet, and how to think about the relationship between uh, people's values and those future decisions is a really difficult ethical question. Uh, often there are ethical issues that arise when decisions need to be made about whether, when, and how to discharge uh, in someone who has been an inpatient in a, in a facility into the community. And those often relate to actually the point I have at the bottom, which is about the ethical difficulty of balancing uh, apparently conflicting values, right? So one um, sort of type of tension that often arises in healthcare is a tension or an apparent conflict between the values of safety or well-being of our patients and the autonomy or um, independence of our patients, right? So often the safest thing for our patients is not necessarily the thing that they wanna do. Uh, 
and we could sort of most max we could maximally respect their autonomy by letting them do or enabling them or supporting them in embarking on a path that would enable them to do something that's not very safe. And this this sort of conflict or tension between safety and autonomy uh, uh, is or gives rise to many ethical issues. And also there are issues related to say privacy and confidentiality, how to navigate um, the ethical dimensions of collection, use, and disclosure of all the sensitive information that, that sort of uh, becomes available to us and flows in all kinds of complex ways within healthcare organizations. And uh, sort of at, in, in a high level way, like the aim of ethics consultation is multifaceted, I would say. So in the most basic sense, <clears throat> ethicists aim to support the people who are involved in and facing these ethical issues in identifying them uh, and sort of characterizing and articulating and clarifying them in order, in order to be able to tackle them appropriately. Uh, ethicists often will, will attempt to, to uh, resolve or mitigate ethical issues by sort of getting clarity on, on what are all the respective roles and responsibilities when there are ethical issues that are encountered, right? So who are the right decision makers? How do we apportion decision-making responsibility when there are multiple decisions to be made? Uh, and in sort of clarifying what are the various sort of decisional and procedural pathways that might be followed to get to the different outcomes that we might want. Um, ethical discussions can be quite useful for exploring uh, a wide variety of possible uh, uh, responses to an ethical issue, possible outcomes of those responses, and sort of considering the alternatives and how they relate to one another. And ethics consultation can be useful sometimes for, for uncovering common ground when various stakeholders in a particular way, situation seem to be at odds, right? Seem to have divergent expectations or divergent values or divergent preferences. <coughs> Pardon me. So one of the things that uh, Robert had suggested I, I talk a bit about in this context was not just like what do ethicists do, but how do they sort of fit into and relate to uh, clinical teams in healthcare organizations. And I, I kind of thinking about it, I, I thought that one way to, to, to explain this or to, to think through it is by reference to the idea of clinical ethics consultation. So I've suggested that clinical ethics consultation is the kind of um, primary work that ethicists do that is directly connected to and involves interaction and discussion and work with uh, clinical teams in healthcare facilities. And I think that the, the ways in which the ethicist can sort of fit into uh, or be integrated with clinical teams, with the healthcare team, really depends on the way in which they approach or think about clinical ethics consultation. And there, there's a great uh, variety of approaches to clinical ethics consultation. So if you talk to uh, different ethicists, they will approach their consultation practices in different ways. And this kind of goes back to uh, something I addressed before, which is, which is the lack of central sort of oversight or coordination or governing body um, that sets particular standards for how ethics is to be practiced. So there's a great degree of variety. And the ways in which the ethicist will sort of fit into or be integrated with a clinical team depends on how they approach their clinical ethics consultation. So this simplifies matters uh, a little bit, but I, I think it can be useful to think about um, the different models of clinical ethics consultation on a kind of spectrum from the most highly formalized or structured approach to clinical ethics consultation to sort of less and less formalized and structured. So, some uh, ethicists have, and this is, I think this model is, is getting less and less common. It's certainly not very as common in Canada as I understand it to be, for example, in, in the States. Uh, but some ethicists approach clinical ethics consultation in a highly formalized or structured way. So uh, this approach tends to have the ethicist as a kind of reactive person available within the organization to be contacted to initiate a sort of very uh, rigidly structured procedure for doing a clinical ethics consultation, right? So uh, often ethicists who, who sort of practice in this way, I think are more likely to have their sort of focus of their work be say like in the office awaiting calls or referrals when 
a consultation, when a consultation gets initiated, there's often a specific procedure to be followed and it may involve striking a specific uh, a co a committee with a specific type of composition. It may have rules about exactly who to interview, who to speak to, when, patients, families, clinicians, and sometimes it involves sort of a, a requirement to say generate like a report with a recommendation or something like that. Anyway, this, in my view, this kind of highly structured, highly formalized approach to clinical ethics consultation tends to lead to less integration of the ethicist with clinical teams, right? Uh, because the, the strictness or rigidity of the procedures sort of set up barriers between the ethicist and the team to a great extent. Uh, the, the alternative as we go sort of to the other end of this, the spectrum are sort of less formalized, less structured approaches. And I, I kind of think that these, I kind of favor this type of approach. I think it leads to greater integration with the healthcare team. Uh, and I think the reasons for that, that if you, if you have a less formalized and less structured approach to clinical ethics consultation, this means you're available to offer ethics support in whatever different ways are going to be useful for the teams that you're working with, right? So folks who practice ethics in this sort of less formalized and structured way will tend to do things like uh, try to periodically say drop by rounds uh, on, on the units in the organizations where they work to get to know team members, to try and build uh, rapport and relationships and trust and to learn about how things operate on the different units and to get a kind of fine grained appreciation for, for how their work goes. Um, by doing that and by trying to build those relationships, uh, you sort of enable, in my view, uh, a variety of different kinds of interactions, right? You're available for sort of what they sometimes call curbside clinical ethics consultation, right? A quick chat, um, uh, a quick aside to discuss an issue, a quick phone call to, to, to see if uh, something that seems like it might be an ethical issue needs greater uh, digging into an engagement by an ethicist. Now, of course, practicing the less formalized or structured approach doesn't rule out sort of doing quite formalized structured uh, ethics activities like facilitating, say, uh, a, a family meeting between a clinical team and a substitute decision maker to kind of really work through a complex ethical decision that needs to get made. But I kind of think that this less formalized, less structured approach makes the ethicist more available, more integrated with clinical ethics teams and, and pardon me, with clinical teams. And that's kind of the approach that, that I have favored. And for those of you who, who work at Providence, I, I had the opportunity, I think, to, to meet and work with some of you, but not all of you. Um, and it's certainly my hope to operate in that way uh, and to be available in a very informal uh, way to, to have engagement with me be a very low stakes thing where you can feel free to give me a call or ask me to drop by the unit. Um, and that type of thing. So that's my kind of thinking about how ethicists fit on into the healthcare team. So I know I've gone a little bit long. I want to just quickly uh, touch on uh, two things that I think are worth noting uh, that ethicists don't do. So we've talked about what ethics is, we've talked about who ethicists are, we've talked about what they do, and now I just want to highlight a couple of things that that maybe, maybe they don't do or, sh or shouldn't do. And I, I think I want to highlight these because Sometimes I think when people hear the term ethicist, there may be baggage that goes along with it or, or assumptions associated with the idea of an ethicist. And uh, I think it's worth sort of highlighting those so we can set them aside. And I think it makes uh, ethics work more productive. So the two things that, that I wanna note that, that uh, ethicists don't do, or at any rate, I, I don't think they should do most of the time uh, is one, Ethicists generally aren't decision makers, right? So, and this is particularly true in the clinical context, right? So when there are difficult ethical decisions that need to be made, say about treatments, uh, about whether, patient, whether patients are incapable, what they're capable or incapable of deciding, or say about discharge or any number of things, right? Ethicists shouldn't really be showing up as the decision makers. They're generally decisional supports, right? So ethicists, uh, should always sort of leave the decisions and be clear about where the decisions properly lie, right? Like who the appropriate decision makers are. And depending on what the decision is, the, the decision maker might be the client, the patient, the resident herself, it could be an SDM, it could be the healthcare team as a whole, or it could be a particular member of the healthcare team. But at any rate, the, the ethicist is, is rarely gonna be, and almost always shouldn't be, the decision maker. 
the ethicist is a decisional support and may offer recommendations, but often those recommendations won't be for particular decisions, but for particular ways of thinking about and approaching decisions. And the other point I wanted to mention, and I think this is maybe even more important, um, when folks hear the, the term ethicist, I think it's sometimes common to assume that, that, an, that ethicists are there to ensure that everybody's doing things right and to sort of catch people when they're not doing, uh, when they're doing things wrong. Uh, this is sometimes ethicists uh, capture, <laughs> capture this idea, uh, capture this using the term of uh, the morality police. But ethicists really aren't, or, or at any rate, really shouldn't be the morality police. Um, the role of ethicists is not to sort of show up and, and watch folks and sort of uh, uh, trip them up when they're doing things wrong. The, the, the focus of the ethicist, and this relates to the idea of the ethicist being a decisional support, the ethicist really should be forward looking. So the ethicist is focused on supporting people in making decisions that they're facing now. Uh, and that means the clinical teams, it means patients, residents, family members, right? It's really, it's really decisionally oriented uh, and not backwards looking. So, so ethicists aren't or really shouldn't be there to uh, rehash or address or you know, certainly not like deliver sanctions or condemnation for decisions or behaviors that have already occurred, even if those behaviors or decisions may have been ethically uh, suboptimal. But in general, right, there, are other, there tend to be other types of mechanisms uh, in healthcare organizations for, for that backward looking um, aspect of decision making, right? For, uh, for looking at what's happened in the past. Now that doesn't mean that ethicists aren't available to talk to, through things that happened, that have happened in the past, right? To do say debriefs on ethically challenging cases that maybe now are closed, but we think there might be some lessons from them. But when ethicists do that sort of backward looking thing, they really shouldn't be there to say who did what wrong when. Uh, they really should be there to, to offer support to teams um, to talk through things in safe spaces and to kind of look for potential lessons or pot potential um, ideas for doing things better going forward. Okay, so though that's, uh, those are my thoughts on what an ethicist does. Uh, I really thank you guys for your attention and for joining us. And I'm sorry I went a little bit long, but I think we've got 20 minutes for, for discussion if, if folks are interested. And of course, if uh, in the discussion, anything comes up that you, or if you don't want to talk about something sort of live right now, uh, do feel free to drop me an email at uh, my province email address. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That was a very helpful uh, overview and uh, introduction to the work that you do, the important work that you do and the value you add to clinical teams. Uh, we do have lots of time for questions and uh, discussion and just open it up to anybody who wants to jump in, ask a question or uh, make a comment. No pressure, of course, but uh, happy to <laughs> chat about anything. Maybe there's some uh, specific but anonymous cases you'd like to ask Jeremy about or um, reflect on some of your own experiences of working with an ethicist, what might be improved or? Hi, Jeremy. I'm Janita Kobus. I'm a spiritual health practitioner at Kingston General. Hi, Janita. And, hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you could maybe share an example with us of a case that you were involved in and, and how that was beneficial. And yeah, if you could just share a case with us. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that. Um, so I always feel, I always feel self-conscious, self uh, when saying like, uh, you know, here's a case I was involved in where things really went well. Um, but, but let me, let me just share one. So I was once involved, involved in a case at not, not, uh, at my present organization. I won't speak about any present, uh, any cases from my present organization, but I was involved in a case where there was a, an, a, an elderly woman uh, who was suffering from a cancer and for a variety of reasons also was in need of a feeding tube uh, if, if she was going to, to be able to, to continue to live to receive cancer treatment. Um, but this patient uh, did not want to um, 
did not want to accept the feeding tube and was aware of the fact that not accepting the feeding tube would, would probably preclude getting treatment in the end uh, because, it, because she wouldn't be able to eat, she wouldn't be able to, to, to live long enough to get the treatment, um, but still didn't want to get it. And this was a case I think is, tend, can be, has kind of quite common features. Uh, there were a number of family members, including the, uh, who would be the substitute decision maker for, uh, for the patient, were adamant that the patient should receive the G-tube uh, and should get cancer treatment, again, against the wishes of the patient. Now, part of what made this case difficult, I think, for the team was that the patient w w expressed uh, views about this, but w had, a, had a tendency to sort of defer um, to the other, to the sort of vocal family members. So when family members were sort of a, around, uh, she might not be as open about her wishes as when they were not around um, uh, and may even sort of signal almost it, behaviors and expressions that could be interpreted as accepting the, her family members' wishes. The clinical team was, was very uncomfortable with the idea of um, inserting a G-tube in this particular case as it was against the express wishes of the patient, but they, they weren't really sure, felt like they, they maybe didn't have uh, the language to communicate uh, or to, to work through with the substitute decision maker and the family members, the concerns that they had. And part of the problem was that substitute decision makers were of the view, or the substitute decision maker and the, the family were of the view that uh, this was the patient's daughter, was of the view that she was the substitute decision maker and, and therefore uh, she could make treatment decisions for the patient. Uh, now, in a way, this, it's, it's kind of straightforward. The patient has wishes uh, and they, they kind of need to be respected. There needs to be all kinds of discussion that goes into um, that kind of decision because it's a very significant decision. But for a patient who's capable and the healthcare team was not willing to find this patient incapable, uh, her wishes, in fact, have to stand. And so the, the team asked me to, to come to a discussion with the substitute decision maker and with them to sort of talk through uh, the role of a substitute decision maker uh, and to talk, talk through uh, the importance of the patient's wishes. So in this particular case, I, I think, uh, and, and there are all kinds of cases that have this sort of texture, uh, it strikes, struck me as really important to get clear on what the ethical, this is an ethical and legal role of substitute decision makers, right? which is not to um, demand particular treatments, right? It's not to be, it's not, a, 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 one doesn't have the right to request or order particular treatments for a loved one, right? One's role as a substitute decision maker, if and when one's called upon to make a decision uh, is to give or withhold consent to treatments that are proposed or recommended by the team. So uh, really what, what I did in that particular case was talk through with the daughter the, the, the idea of, um, patient capacity and the importance of respecting patient autonomy when patients haven't been found incapable and talk through the role of a substitute decision maker, which is in fact not to, uh, to order as a say or demand particular treatments, but to give or withhold consent to specific treatments. And it was, I think it was an appreciation, one, an opportunity to sit down and in a lower temperature context, talk through the importance of patient wishes and how we think about capacity and decision-making in the healthcare context and what the way, the way to sort of conceive of the substitute decision-maker role uh, that ultimately enabled, I mean, it was a very sort of uh, a very sad situation, but it sort of set the tone, reset the tone, I think, between the substitute decision-maker and the family and the team in a way mm -hmm. that enabled them to offer ultimately, I think, better support for that patient. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, in this particular case, in some respects, the decision was was already made, but it was a matter of, uh, or I think the team was relatively clear on what this what decision they had to do. I mean, they couldn't, they didn't feel that it would be right in that context to find the patient incapable given their assessment. Um, but they, they didn't sort of know how to how to how to bridge the gap between their perspective on the situation and the substitute decision makers. And so sometimes just the opportunity to have those discussions and to contextualize 
all that's going on using uh, sort of explicitly ethical language and concepts and to, and to help uh, support folks in sort of putting the pieces together in a way that makes sense uh, can improve the way that things go. Sorry, I don't know if that was, I think that was kind of a yeah. rambling answer, but. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeremy, for your for your great presentation. Um, one question that came kind of came to mind is uh, you talked a little bit about hot topics and and every kind of case I'm sure emerges. How do you keep your own values and beliefs and from interfering with or um, being enmeshed, I guess, with the cases and everything you deal with, you know, because you are human. And mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. was one of my questions that kind of came to mind. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Mary. That's a, it's a good question. It's, it's a difficult question. I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll start by acknowledging uh, what you point out, which is absolutely true, which is that certainly I and, and all ethicists, or at least all the ethicists I've met are humans. Um, and, uh, and we are all absolutely uh, sort of stuck in our own perspectives uh, in a really fundamental way. We, we, we are not able to completely ever able to completely shed our own particular values and beliefs and, and biases. Um, and those are definitely going to affect the way that any of us work, I think, in any role. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything to sort of mitigate or address the effect of, of our own particular um, beliefs and values, what we think is important when we're doing this kind of work. For me, it, I, I think I, I have a few strategies that I, I think are helpful, I, I hope are helpful. I mean, one is, uh, it, it's really helpful to just be clear on, on like the, the big picture sort of uh, ethical schematic, <laughs> for lack of a better word, um, that, that we generally operate with in healthcare. And to a great extent, this is imposed by legislation, but the legislation sort of maps out some really ethically uh, salient, um, like fixed points of reference, right? So uh, the, the importance of deferring to patient values and wishes when it comes to ethical decision-making, right? Like the patient is the center of concern in healthcare. And I shouldn't say just the patient, the patient, client, the resident, the person who's being served in a particular healthcare organization. Uh, and for capable patients, the role, the, the role of the patient, the role of the healthcare team is to develop proposals, to develop plans of care, to propose them to the patient, to give the patient as much information as possible, uh, and to defer to the patient's wishes about how they want to proceed. When patients are incapable, it moves to substitute decision makers and having clarity about about who are to be substitute decision makers and what the role of a substitute decision maker are. All of that, those set like constraints on how our, what our own values can do, like what kind of role they can play, right? If, we're, if we know our fixed points, then we can, I think, make a, a good effort to sort of, uh, to say like, okay, we put the patient first, decision-making is about the patient. There are procedures and pathways that we need to follow when patients can't make their own decisions. Uh, and we need to sort of, do our best to identify when um, our own particular values are influencing the way we react to cases uh, and try, try to set those aside. I don't think there's any like magic bullet, uh, magic bullet, silver bullet. I don't think there's any uh, one thing that can be done here to do this perfectly. Um, but I'll note that I think one thing that's really important is engaging in discussion with like interdisciplinary teams, right? It's kind of through discussion with folks uh, with, with different perspectives that we often uh, realize that we've been thinking about an issue from a narrower perspective than we need to, or that a particular bias or assumption that we might be bringing to the case is in fact a bias or assumption. Uh, so those are, I mean, I mean a, few, a few things that I, I try to do, um, but I think it's an ongoing challenge and I, I don't think there's any way to completely eliminate it. Jeremy, there's an interesting question in the chat. Can you read it or I'll read it for uh, you? Oh yeah, so I just did. Uh, oh, have, okay. Uh, have you had opportunities to consult on matters addressing COVID-19 protocols that relate to institutional policies 
that go beyond provincial legislation? Uh, yeah, good question. So I've been involved in a variety of different uh, discussions related to uh, different aspects of the health system response to COVID-19. Um, I'll mention kind of my, my first one when I was a, uh, when I was a, a fellow at Unity Health, uh, one of the things that we were involved in responding to or consulting on was provincial planning for implementing uh, triage protocols uh, for the to, uh, triage planning uh, to for responding to what they called like ma a major surge of patients in need of critical care. Uh, so there were all kinds of really comp complex ethical issues embedded in that planning. The province was, or, or uh, um, Ontario Health was drafting uh, specific protocols and organizations were trying to figure out how they would implement those protocols in their own contexts. Uh, and uh, I don't know what just happened there. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I was certainly involved at, at my organizations there in sort of working through the triage protocols, identifying what the fixed points were in the triage protocols, identifying where there was discretion left for organizational decision making or where the triage protocol didn't speak to particular issues that the uh, organization would have to address and try to figure out how to address those in ethical ways. Um, there, I mean, there are all kinds of sort of uh, salient ethical issues that organizations have had to deal with and, and I've you know, been tangentially involved in, in all kinds of different discussions, right? Even visitor policies have been a really big one, right? Um, during COVID-19, there's been this really difficult problem, which is that the safest way to go forward for, for many folks in the hospital is to limit as much as possible the number of people who come to, uh, uh, to healthcare facilities. But of course, that's just, again, safety is one value, but people in healthcare facilities also really value and benefit from having visitors. And so there are really difficult uh, ethical decisions that need to be made about how to balance the value of, uh, of keeping infection out, but also the value of getting visitors and loved ones in to see patients. Um, so those are two that sort of stick out to me as, as discussions that I've been involved with, triage and, and visitor policies. But I mean, in many ways, right, COVID-19 is, is now like, it's the, it's the background context for almost everything that comes up. I, I kind of feel like very few, um, very few issues come up nowadays that aren't in some sense related to or affected by the fact of COVID-19. So thanks for the question. Oh, we got another question. When a patient loses capacity and a physician goes to the substitute decision maker, and they express a code status that is opposite of what the patient may have made clear earlier in an admission, how is this approached? So that's a good question. And uh, it's, a, it's a type of problem that can arise in all kinds of different contexts, right? But the basic, I think what the, the, the questioner is asking is like, if we've got a patient who's recorded particular wishes with respect to code status, and then the patient no longer becomes capable and an SDM wants to, wants to change that code status, how do we respond to that? Um, I don't think there's one type of response or so there's one specific response. I think it's going to depend on the details, but I think a few things to be attentive to is that are, are uh, one is that uh, a question like that I think a lot of us, and certainly my mind jumps to cases where it really looks like the SDM is now going against the patient's wishes. But it's worth noting that depending on how the circumstances may have changed since the patient sort of capably recorded wishes and values with respect to code status, um, depending on how circumstances may, have, circumstances may have changed, the substitute decision maker's wishes could actually line up with the patient's wishes, right? Because the patient's medical circumstances, uh, prognosis, quality of life, uh, any number of things may have changed since the patient first recorded uh, their wishes with respect to code status. So I think that's one thing that needs to be borne in mind. Of course, sometimes it will in fact be clear that uh, that the substitute decision maker uh, is, is really, um, this sounds maybe more negatively valenced than I want it to, but sometimes it will seem like the substitute decision maker is, is basically going against or contradicting the clear wishes of the patient. And this is probably, uh, 
Uh, the clearest case of this may be when there's a patient who's, who's relatively near to end of life and records a capable wish for, um, uh, for, for a, basically a no code status. Uh, and the substitute decision maker after the patient loses uh, capacity, a substitute decision maker says, no, let's, we wanna go full code. Um, how do we respond to cases like this? I mean, almost always the first step is to engage in discussion and conversation and communication with substitute decision maker about the rationale or the reasoning for their decision making, uh, about how their decision making takes into account the what we know about the patient's uh, previously expressed wishes and beliefs uh, and about the patient's current clinical situation. Uh, we also have to be clear about about what the particular sort of um, protocols are for actually for changing code statuses. Um, code status is a really interesting sort of decisional point uh, in health ethics. And it is, in some contexts, it can be thought of as a, as a treatment decision for which consent is needed. Um, but it's not, in fact, always the case that a physician needs consent in order to record particular code statuses. Uh, so the, the, the details of the case really matter. Um, but uh, in general, the first step is always going to be trying to understand the rationale, trying to see how the decision making lines up with the, wish, the wishes and values of the patient and trying to, um, if, if there's a firm belief that the decision is not in accordance with the, the values and wishes of the patient and doesn't match the patient's clinical circumstances, uh, then to be very clear about that, to be clear about the reasoning for that with the SDM uh, and, and to get clear on uh, whether and how uh, code status does or doesn't need to be changed depending on SDM's wishes, right? If we recall that SDMs don't, have a right necessarily to uh, demand particular treatments or particular treatment plans. Actually, neither patients nor SDMs uh, have that particular right. Um, really, their role is to, to give or withhold consent to treatments and treatment plans that are proposed or recommended by the team. So all of that is going to influence the way I think a, a situation like that would need to be approached. Uh, what is the difference between an SDM and a POA? Uh, so this is a, a kind of a big question. So SDM, uh, short for substitute decision maker, POA stands for power of attorney. So I think that the easiest way to think about this is uh, an SDM, substitute decision maker, is really a role that's that fleshed out specifically in, in Ontario. It's fleshed out specifically in the Healthcare Consent Act. And an SDM is someone who, under the Healthcare Consent Act, is uh, has the authority to give or withhold consent uh, to, for treatment decisions for an incapable patient, as well as for uh, admission to or confinement in care facilities and to um, personal assistance services. So uh, SDMs have, have quite a limited role and generally, not all the time, but generally, certainly like in a hospital, most of the decisions that someone would make as an SDM would be treatment decisions. So specific treatment proposals um, brought forward by the care team. Powers of attorney are in many ways more complicated. So there are two main types of power of attorney, power of attorney for property and power of attorney for personal care. Uh, someone who has power of attorney for property is someone uh, who, who is designated by a person explicitly in a power of attorney document to manage the person's property if the person becomes incapable of managing property. And a power of attorney for personal care is someone who's been designated uh, by the, the, the patient designated in writing by a person in question, uh, by like a in, now incapable person to make um, personal care decisions for the person. Uh, I guess the, because we're running out of time, the main thing I would say is that uh, people who have power of attorney may or may not be substitute decision makers for treatment decisions. Um, and the matters that powers of attorney relate to property and personal care decisions are for the most part, not decisions about which healthcare providers can make capacity assessments. So SDMs and POA is kind of the, the, ca the category of SDM and POA interact and overlap in complicated ways. Um, and, uh, but I'd be happy to talk about that more with, with anyone who's interested. Uh, sorry, I know we've now gone over, over time and I'm gonna have to go to another meeting, unfortunately, um, but I wanna thank everybody for for joining.
Thank you very much, Jeremy. Very informative session and uh, so glad you had some time for us today and that you uh, agreed to uh, record the session. I'm happy to share the link with others. And uh, uh, again, uh, thanks. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Nice to meet and see you and have a great day. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye. Thank you.